Hello everyone. Welcome to Law for Clat. I am Shirshok Hosh and I am currently pursuing my LLM from the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences and today I'll be presenting the complete lecture on the law of crimes for CLAT UG 2024. The exam which you all know is going to take place on the 3rd of December 2023. Now before we begin some of our key attractions as you all know that with us you can study and learn from the NLU and IIM students. You can have a complete course from scratch. We will be providing you with mock test series and latest CLAT pattern. You can have practice sessions, doubt clearing sessions, etc. Uh, at the same time, we also have our one on one mentorship plans, okay, which is double nine per person. We also have these series of mock tests, uh, which are included in the paid plans. As per your convenience, you can take any of them. Now, we will quickly be moving on into our today's main video, which is the law of crimes. Now, before we begin, it is very essential to define what is a crime. Now, crime is an act or omission which is considered harmful or wrong by the society and is made punishable by the law. So, if there is any act which we consider harmful, but there is no punishment for it, then that will not be a crime. Now, whenever we are considering the definition of crime, we have to keep this maxim in our mind. Actus non facet rium nisi mens sit ria. Now, what does this maxim mean? This maxim means that the act alone is not sufficient to commit a crime, but it must be accompanied with a guilty mind. So, in a sense, a crime has two elements. The actus reus and the mens rea. Actus reus means the guilty act or a wrongful act. But is that all? No. We also need a guilty mind accompanied with it. So if I am committing any act which is a guilty act but the mens rea is not present then that act in general circumstances will not amount to a crime, though that might be a tort. Now, if we take this case, for example, Queen versus Tolson. Now, what happened in this case? There was a husband who went off to the sea and he was missing. The husband was missing for six long years. Now, after waiting for six years, his wife decided to marry again because obviously her husband had been missing for six years and when the wife married at that moment after six years the husband came back the husband saw that his, that his wife was marrying again and the husband filed a case a criminal case of bigamy against his wife bigamy as you know is marrying once again while your spouse is living now the court said that here yes the wife had married again so a guilty act was present a guilty act was present right but the guilty mind was not present in sense there was no mens rea the wife did not have an intention to marry again why because the wife had thought that the husband had died because the husband had not been absent for or the husband had been absent for six years so the wife was under this presumption that the husband had died that is why she was marrying again so she had no intention to commit bigamy that is why the court held that the wife was not guilty the wife was not guilty was her act guilty yes but her intention was not wrong that's why Following this maxim, actus non facetrium nisi mens citria, the wife was held not to be guilty. We move on to the next slide. Now, here we will be discussing the stages of a crime. 
what are the stages how does one commit a crime now the first stage of a crime is the intention the crime takes birth in our minds when we think of committing a crime or we want to commit a crime that is the birthplace of the crime that is human mind we have the intention this is stage 1 but is intention enough to be punished to be uh, to, to be uh, for us to punish someone no for example a might intend to kill b he has the intention to kill b but merely for this intention we cannot put a behind the bars right so yes intention we can say is the first stage of the crime but it is not punishable second stage is preparation after having the intention we will prepare to commit the crime okay it can be purchasing arms it can be planning it can be uh, you know doing any other thing which will eventually help us in undertaking the actual act so that is the preparation stage or the stage 2 now is preparation punishable generally preparation is not punishable but preparation becomes punishable in four cases in four cases even preparation becomes punishable firstly when somebody is preparing to wage war against the government of india if somebody is preparing to wage a war against the government of india then that preparation itself is punishable under section 122 of ipc secondly if somebody is preparing to commit depredation on territories of power at peace with government of india that is some territories which are at peace with government of india if somebody is preparing to wage war or uh, basically attack those territories then once again the preparation itself is punishable if somebody is preparing to commit dacoity under section 399 mere preparation to commit dacoity what is dacoity we will be seeing in the later part of this video but note this that section 399 of ipc says that mere preparation of dacoity is also punishable and lastly preparing to counterfeit coins and government stamps is also punishable that is section 233 to 235 of ipc so in these four cases in these four cases we will find that even preparation of an offense is punishable though in general circumstances preparation is not punishable next we come to attempt now after we have prepared we have made the complete preparation for the offense we will make our attempt to commit the crime now is attempt punishable yes attempt is always punishable we will find section 511 which is the last section of ipc which punishes attempt to commit offenses in some cases there are specific sections which punish the attempt to commit that crime for example section 307 which punishes the attempt to commit murder somebody has not committed murder but he merely attempted to commit murder even that will be punishable and lastly commission when the crime is committed successfully we'll say the crime has been committed and as you know commission of a crime is definitely punishable so just to revise intention is no way punishable preparation generally is not punishable but is punishable in these four cases attempt is always punishable commission is also punishable obviously now if we move on we'll begin with some of the important concepts given in ipc the indian penal code is the major substantive criminal law of our country it is the major substantive criminal law of our country now the ipc defines various offenses and prescribes punishment for them the first kind of offense which we will be looking into is joint liability we will be specifically looking into section 34 and section 149 read with 141 now the first section 34 talks about common intention which reads 
when a criminal act is done by several persons in furtherance of a common intention of all each of such persons is liable for that act in the same manner as if it were done by him alone now let us take an example say for an example a b c and d four friends they together plan to commit a robbery in the house of mr e now a b c d all of them had the same intention or the common intention of committing this robbery let's say all of them went at night to e's place and four of them asked of or four of them decided that d will be standing outside and watching whether anybody is coming or not a b and c will enter c will let's say cut off the main electricity line so that there will be darkness all around a and b will enter the house and commit the robbery a will further ensure that e does not get up or intervene in their robbery in any way now here when they will be caught it has to be seen that all of them a b c and d though their acts were not equal because we might say that d only was waiting outside c only switched off the electricity a and b were the ones who actually committed the robbery yet since all of them had the common intention to do the robbery all of them will be equally punished because all of them will be punished as if it were done by that person alone so all of them will be equally punished for robbery now if we look into common object what is common object common object means if an offence is committed by any member of an unlawful assembly in prosecution of common object of that assembly every person who is a member of the same assembly is guilty of that offence now let us say for an example there is an unlawful assembly okay now in this unlawful assembly there are various members okay now when this unlawful assembly is prosecuting its object any person who is merely present in this assembly who knows nothing about this assembly who has no idea as to what is going on he has no participation in the actual acts he is just a member he is just present physically present there he is just a member when this assembly when this unlawful group does any act this person who was just physically present there will also be punishable will be also be punished okay so the difference between common intention and common object is that in common intention everybody had the intention but in common object everybody did not have any common intention the unlawful assembly had an object so we are saying common object of that assembly we are not saying common object of that person but we are saying common object of that assembly and in that assembly whoever is merely physically present will be punished though they may have done or not done anything but in case of joint but in case of common intention we have seen that they had some role to play even though it was a meager role but they had some role to play in the actual commission of the offence but in common object we have seen that merely being a member and not doing anything can still be punished now we move on to the general exceptions which are provided in chapter 4 of ipc now these are some exceptional grounds where if you are accused of any offence you can take up any of these grounds as a defence so these we can say are grounds of defence which an accused person can take up firstly mistake of fact now as you all know that mistake of fact is excusable but mistake of law is not excusable as we say ignorantia juris non excusat so if any person has done any act which is under a mistake of fact where he was under the mistaken belief of a fact then that person can take up this defense and he will not be guilty secondly judicial acts if a judge 
has done anything while he was acting judicially while he was giving his judgment then he will not be guilty or if any act is done in furtherance of a judgment then also the person will not be guilty next if there is any accident while lawful activities while somebody is doing any lawful activity but there is any accident then that person will not be guilty then necessity if somebody has done any act because it was necessary to do so to prevent greater harm then that act is also not guilty provided the act was necessary to prevent any greater harm next infancy now this was there in section 82 and 83 of ipc however currently we follow the law which is laid down in the juvenile justice act so what does the current law on juvenile justice say or let us look into how the juvenile justice act has actually changed this proposition now we will not be actually looking into 82 and 83 because technically speaking they have become obsolete now with the coming of the juvenile justice act now the juvenile justice act initially mentioned that anybody who is below 18 years of age will not be treated as an adult he is a juvenile he is a juvenile so he cannot be punished as other adults he will be heard and tried by a juvenile board and will be given some sort of correctional remedies even if he is found guilty the ordinary trial procedure which is followed under crpc will not be applying in cases of juveniles but we saw in the 2012 nirbhaya case which is the infamous delhi gang rape case where one of the accused was 17 years old and taking help of this provision of the juvenile justice act though he had committed a grave violent offense of rape and attempt to murder of the uh, victim in this case still he was not tried as as an adult rather he was tried as a juvenile and he was given only 3 years of correctional remedy whereas the other accused in the nirbhaya case were all given death penalty so this way this 17 year old accused escaped the death penalty by using the juvenile justice act ultimately in the year 2015 the juvenile justice act was amended and under the new act the under the 2015 juvenile justice act now it says that if anybody is 16 to 18 years old within this time it will be seen that whether that person if he has committed any heinous act any heinous crime whether that person had the mental capacity to understand the nature of his offense if yes then he will be punished as an adult if no then he will be treated as a juvenile anybody who is below 16 that is below 16 will be a juvenile and anybody who is above 18 will definitely be an adult but from 16 to 18 we will see that if in case of heinous acts if the person has the mental capacity to understand the nature of his act then that person will be treated as an adult next we come to the defense of insanity that is if any person has committed any act while he was under the effect of insanity or while he was not in a fit mental stage then he will not be guilty here we follow the rule of mcnaughton's case or the mcnaughton's rule of insanity now this mcnaughton's rule says that while committing the offense the person should be insane or should be under insanity if while committing the offense the person was mentally fit then that person cannot take up this defense of insanity next we move on to the case of intoxication that is if any person is under the influence of alcohol or any intoxicated substance then that person's acts will generally be considered not guilty however we will have to check whether the intoxication was voluntary or involuntary if the intoxication that means if the effect of the alcohol or intoxicant 
was voluntary that means if the person consumed alcohol on his own without any force or without any influence from others then he will not be able to take this defense he will be held guilty for his acts but if the intoxication was involuntary somebody forcefully intoxicated another person or somebody by fraud or by deceit intoxicated some other person then the person can take up the defense of intoxication next up we move to next up we move to the case of consent now if there is any act which is committed by the consent of a person then generally the act will not be held to be guilty compulsion if somebody is compelled or somebody is threatened to do an act at gunpoint somebody is asked to do an act then generally the person will not be guilty for that act communication for benefit now let's say a doctor tells a patient that he is not going to live any longer and by that communication the patient has a heart attack and dies can we say that the doctor is guilty no because the doctor had made a communication for the benefit of the patient next up we have slight harm those acts which are causing slight harm or trifling acts they will not be guilty or they will not be considered crimes and ultimately private defense if anybody has done anything in private defense to protect the body or the property in that case the person will not be guilty if somebody is attacking my body or if somebody is attacking my property or if so i see somebody is attacking another person or another person's property then also i can act in private defense but here i have to remember the rule of proportionality that is my private defense should be proportional to the threat of injury for example if somebody is trying to attack me with bare hands i cannot take up a gun and shoot him at his head my private defense should be in proportion to the gravity of the attack and my private defense or my my right to private defense starts the moment there is apprehension of danger i do not have to wait for actual danger so if i see somebody running at running towards me with a stick or a hockey stick in his hand it is enough for me to exercise private defense i don't have to wait for the moment when he actually stands before me and brandishes the hockey stick whenever i apprehend danger i can start exercising my right of private defense now we move on to inchoate crimes which generally includes abetment and criminal conspiracy now abetment means when i am instigating or influencing some other person to do a crime in that case i the person who has so instigated or so abetted the other person is also guilty now abetment can be done in three ways either by instigation or by intentional aid or by criminal conspiracy so instigation means when a person is let's say instigating or pumping another person to do an act or provoking another person to do an act then that is instigation intentional aid means when a person is willfully helping another person in doing a crime that is also abetment and criminal conspiracy we will look into what is criminal conspiracy under section 120a and 120b now criminal conspiracy means whenever we say whenever we use the term conspiracy it denotes that definitely there are more than uh more, there are more persons than one basically okay that means at least two persons has to be there conspiracy cannot happen in one person okay so two or more persons have to be there okay and there has to be an agreement between them there has to be an agreement between them either to do an illegal act or a legal act by illegal means
either to do an illegal act or a legal act by illegal means so when there is any agreement between two or more persons to do such a legal such an illegal act or a legal act by illegal means then we say that there has been a criminal conspiracy between the two persons so this is abetment and criminal conspiracy next we move on to a very important topic that is offenses against body and the first offense that we do is culpable homicide now homicide means killing of a person culpable means punishable now if we are to consider culpable homicide and murder then we can say that culpable homicide means all types of acts which result in killing of another person which are punishable this is culpable homicide and certain categories of culpable homicide are known as murder okay so we can say that the culpable homicide is the superset and murder is a subset which is included in the culpable homicide category only so that means there are other other types of culpable homicide also what will we call them we will call them we will call them culpable homicide which is not amounting to murder okay so there are other types of culpable homicide also which are not murder we will call them culpable homicide not amounting to murder but generally culpable homicide includes this not amounting to murder and murder both now what is culpable homicide let us understand culpable homicide means when a person is causing the death of another one person causing death of another with number one it can be either with the intention to cause death or the intention to cause such bodily injury as is likely to cause death or the knowledge that he is likely to cause death so if a points a gun at b he knows that he is intending to kill b and shoots so a had the intention of killing b and he causes the death of b this is definitely culpable homicide okay or a causes such harm to b he beats up b to such extent as is likely to co cause the death of b then also he is guilty of culpable homicide or a knows that if he beats up a so much that will cause the death of b and a does so then also a is guilty of culpable homicide so in these three cases the person is guilty of culpable homicide then what is murder obviously these elements you will see are also there in murder as well because murder is nothing but culpable homicides subset it is a type of culpable homicide only but some additional grounds are there in murder so what are they we need to check firstly in murder again one person causing the death of another person with the intention to cause death so again we have intention to cause death so if a harms b in such a way with intending to cause the death of b that is murder or intention to cause such bodily injury as the doer knows is likely to cause death so intention with specific knowledge that means suppose a and b are two friends and 
A knows that B is suffering from some sort of disease in his liver and that if any minor injury is also done to his abdominal area or his liver uh, or basically his abdominal portion then that can even cause his death knowing that a has that specific knowledge about b and knowing that a gives a blow to b's stomach now in ordinary course of nature that would not have killed b or that would not have killed any person but a knows specifically that that kind of an injury in b's abdominal area can cause the death of b and a does so then a is guilty of murder now third is intention to cause such bodily injury which in ordinary course will cause death now in ordinary course if we are let's say stabbing somebody in the heart or stabbing somebody in the stomach or giving a strong blow at the brain or other, that means at the head in ordinary course these acts will cause the death of somebody so if somebody does any of these acts which ordinary in the ordinary course of nature are very well known that they will cause the death so then also the person will be guilty of murder and finally the doer has the knowledge here we are talking about knowledge knowledge that the act in all probability will cause death that means suppose the doer of this act has knowledge that if he does this act there is no possibility that the other person can be spared okay then the person is also said to be committing murder so in any of these four cases the person is said to be committing not only culpable homicide but culpable homicide which is equal to murder okay now the interesting fact is that there are certain cases or there are certain exceptions to murder to murder there are certain exceptions so you might ask what will happen if these exceptions are at that means if the case falls in any of these exceptions then simply we will say that it is not murder but it is still culpable homicide right so if the case falls in any of these exceptions then we will say that it is culpable homicide not amounting to murder right that is this area this shaded area this uh, dotted area rather okay if the case falls under any of the exceptional cases then it is in this dotted area which is culpable homicide not amounting to murder and if it falls in any of these a b c d then it falls in this shaded area which is murder okay am i clear so the first type of exception is grave and sudden provocation grave and sudden provocation so if somebody provokes another person gra gravely and in a sudden manner and in a sudden fit of rage the other person does something then that grave and sudden provocation is actually the reason why the doer actually did the act in that case it will not be called murder but it will be culpable homicide not amounting to murder now if you remember the case of the nanavati case okay which has been developed in the or has been you know made into the film rustam okay it is the nanavati case wherein there was the defense of grave and sudden provocation was taken up however the court had rejected this defense of grave and sudden provocation stating that there was sufficient time there was sufficient time to recover from the provocation that means suppose i gave you a provocation or i provoked you with some in a grave manner in the morning and in the evening you come to my house with a gun and shoot me down you cannot take the defense of grave and sudden provocation because the time has lapsed 
so for grave and sudden provocation we have to see that in a fit of immediate anger you are taking the action that is grave and sudden provocation only then you can say that it falls under this exception so that the punishment will be not murder but of culpable homicide not amounting to murder secondly private defense if somebody kills another person in private defense and that is generally not allowed in the cases where a private defense applies okay because you know you can use private defense to even kill somebody in certain cases but let's say that is not one of those cases in that case also murder you will not be uh, guilty of murder but you will be guilty of culpable homicide not amounted to murder the third ground is public servant okay if any public servant is acting for public justice okay then also we will say it is not murder then in sudden fight without planning or without any premeditation so if there is a sudden fight and somebody in that sudden fight causes the death of another person that will not be murder but culpable homicide not amounting to murder and lastly if there is consent if there is consent then also it will not be murder it will be culpable homicide not amounting to murder now we move on to the next set of offenses death by negligence now if somebody does any rash or negligent act let's say rash driving negligently a person is driving in that case the person will be punished not because of murder or culpable homicide but death by negligence which is provided in section 304a now we are not going into the punishments the punishment for death by negligence is far lesser than that of murder or culpable homicide if we see it is 2 years of punishment okay whereas for murder we have even death penalty for culpable homicide not amounting to murder we have 10 years or life imprisonment but in case of death by negligence it's a far lesser punishment because obviously there was no intention or knowledge but the death happened just due to a negligent or rash act next we come to dowry death if a person or more specifically if the wife has been killed or has committed suicide because of incessant demands of dowry from her husband or her husband relatives within 7 years of marriage so it has to be seen that the suicide or the death of the wife has happened within 7 years of marriage then it will be presumed we will we'll discuss this uh, provision later on while we are doing the provisions of offenses relating ma- relating to marriage but just keep this in mind that if the if the death of the wife is happened is is you know taking place within 7 years of the marriage then it will be presumed that the death is because of dowry okay provided that it is shown that there was some sort of cruelty towards her or harassment that she was subjected to cruelty or harassment because of demands of dowry it will be presumed that the death is because of demand for dowry with that we move on to the next set of offenses which is sexual offenses now here we need to keep in mind that the 2013 and 2018 amendments played a major role in reshaping the laws of sexual offenses in india we also have to keep in mind that the 2013 amendment took place after the nirbhaya case and the 2018 amendment took place after the kathua rape case so these are two very significant cases which triggered the law makers to bring about significant changes in our criminal law system providing for the punishment of sexual offenses now the first uh, provision which we will be studying is outraging modesty of a woman so if anybody assaults or uses criminal force to outrage the modesty of a woman to somehow violate the modesty of a woman then that act is punishable under section 354 of ipc and here we should also keep in mind section 509 of ipc which provides for insult on modesty of a woman so we'll read this with section 
509 which provides for insult on the modesty of a woman next up we have the provision of sexual harassment which was added by the 2013 amendment that is section 354a now this provision says that if a man commits any type of physical contact or advancements with sexual color or any demand or request of sexual fav uh, favors or the man shows pornography to the woman or makes any sexually colored remarks in these cases the man will be held guilty of sexual harassment now one thing which we must note that in case of sexual offenses we do not have a gender neutral law the law is targeted only to women victims so the victim can only be a woman okay and not a man now if a person intends to disrobe a woman that is punishable under 354b voyeurism is also punished voyeurism means what voyeurism means if you are uh, watching or recording a woman while in her private acts for example if there is a person who is taking a bath maybe in the washroom and somebody is secretly uh, recording that or watching that that is voyeurism that is also punished stalking okay as you all know that stalking or following somebody unnecessarily even after being told not to that is punishable acid attacks section 326a that has also been added by the 2013 amendment okay now these were the provisions which were made after the 2013 amendment that is the amendment which was brought in after the nirbhaya case and it significantly changed the laws relating to sexual offenses and next up we'll be continuing the series with the various offenses uh, which are the categories of rape now the section 375 which defines rape gives a very expansive definition now which has been modified by the 2013 amendment once again and it basically now includes not only the Pino vaginal sexual intercourse but any type of penetration any type of at any part of the body of the victim any type of penetration is included in the definition of rape now so it is a very wide expansive definition of rape which we can say under which is given under section 375 and punishment for rape is given in section 376 now section 375 has two exceptions section 375 has two exceptions the first one is medical procedure if for any medical procedure there is any type of penetration that of course is not rape and secondly if there is husband wife relation now marital rape we are saying that uh, basically we can see that there is a lot of debate and discussion about marital rape and the supreme court is still yet to take a call on marital rape but as far as the law in IPC states, marital rape is not rape because when there is husband-wife relationship, it falls under the exception. IPC says that the wife has to be above 15 years, but now the law is that the wife has to be above 18 years. Not 15 years, but the wife has to be above 18 years. If the wife is below 18, then we will consider that is rape. Now, this law was modified after the case of independent thought. This is an important case. Independent thought versus union of india which increased the rape uh, the the age of the wife from 15 years to 18 years so previously if a wife was let's say 16 or 17 years old even then that would not be considered rape but now if the wife is below 18 years then that will be considered rape okay and for the intercourse to be coming within this exceptional case the age of the wife must be above 18 years now we have various other definitions of rape if we see rape of woman below 16 years which is 376 uh, subsection 3 rape causing death or pvs pvs stands for permanent vegetative state okay um, basically the case of aruna shanbag if you are aware of aruna shanbag's case where the rape of a nurse had 
caused her to go into a permanent coma state or permanent vegetative state okay and the irony was that she went into a permanent coma for her entire life but the accused was only punished for 7 years because the law at that time was not that strict enough but now if you see after the 2013 amendment this has been made punishable with death that means now the ones which are marked red that is rape causing death or permanent vegetative state rape of woman below 12 years of age which was added after the 2018 amendment all these are punishable with death penalty okay gang rape on woman below 12 years is also punishable with death penalty if a repeat offender that means one who has already convicted of rape once again commits rape that is repeat offenders there is also death penalty so in these stringent case or in these grave offenses there is stringent punishment prescribed that is death penalty other offenses are also there for example gang rape gang rape on women below 16 years of age sexual intercourse during judicial separation okay sexual intercourse by person in authority okay so in these cases also uh, the criminal law amendments have increased the ambit of punishment now when we are studying this provision we also have to remember a landmark case that is the mathura rape case the mathura rape case or which is the formally uh, which is properly known as tukaram versus state of maharashtra now 1979 okay now in this case basically there was custodial rape policemen had committed custodial rape on a village girl and the question was that whether the girl had given her consent or not now the trial court had held that the girl had given the consent and it was not rape the bombay high court overruled this decision and held that there was no consent because consent is a very important factor okay and if somebody is remaining silent that does not mean consent passive submission does not amount to consent that is what the bombay high court held but then it was overruled by the supreme court and the supreme court held that this was not a case of rape and it acquitted the two accused constables the, the accused policemen now this led to various protests said you know wide criticism against the supreme court judgment in the mathura rape case from across walks of the society from academicians scholars to lawyers judges politicians everyone criticized this judgment and eventually there was the 1983 amendment 1983 amendment which added section 114 a of the indian evidence act this is not in ipc but in evidence act now what does this section say this section says that if sexual uh, if sexual intercourse is proven between a man and a woman then it will be presumed that the woman had not given consent if she accuses the other person of rape it will be presumed that she had not given her consent provided that sexual harassment uh, or sorry sexual intercourse is proved so now basically what it means is that it will be on the accused person to show that there was consent the burden of proof is now shifting on the accused person to show that he is not guilty that there was consent okay so this is a very significant case and a significant amendment next up we move on to kidnapping and abduction now kidnapping which is defined in section 359 can be of two types kidnapping from india and kidnapping from the lawful guardianship now when we say kidnapping it can be of a male who is below 16 a female who is below 18 or of a person of unsound mind if any of these people are kidnapped from their lawful guardians that is punishable under section 363 actually it is defined in 361 punished under 363 abduction now abduction means if a person compels or induces another person 
can be an adult okay that is male above 16 or female above 18 any adult person also if he is uh, basically compelled or influenced to move from one place to another let's say from this spot he is moved from to this spot okay that is known as abduction so it is not necessary that he is you know confined tied up in some place and you ask for ransom or something like that no it is a continuing offense if a person is moved from one place to another that is sufficient to cause abduction okay whereas kidnapping has to be either outside of india somebody is taken outside india or these three category of people are taken outside their lawful guardianship so in kidnapping there is a concept of taking somebody outside of either the country or the lawful guardianship but abduction on the other hand is just movement from one place to the other okay then we come to unnatural offenses basically this provision section 377 of ipc was criminalizing sexual intercourse which was against the order of nature in sense any type of sexual intercourse which was non penovaginal or not the conventional sexual intercourse between a man and a woman anything other than that was punishable so basically same sex intercourse or intercourse between man and man or woman and woman female and female or any other sort of intercourse okay it was all held to be punishable as unnatural offenses so this was discriminating against the lgbtqia plus community and any type of uh, same sex intercourse was not allowed it was held to be a criminal offense so in the nas foundation case which is landmark case of the delhi high court it had held that this section 377 is violative of the constitution the nas foundation case had relied on various foreign judgments okay um, and especially it had referred to the case of lawrence versus texas which is a us supreme court case which had basically decriminalized same sex intercourse so relying on this lawrence versus texas which is a us supreme court case the nas foundation uh, in the nas foundation case the delhi high court held that section 377 is wrong so it allowed the same sex intercourse but in 2014 the supreme court overruled this decision and once again criminalized same sex intercourse finally in 2017 in the ks puttaswamy versus union of india which is known as the aadhar judgment or the right to privacy judgment in this case it was held that privacy is a fundamental right and sexual preference or sexual orientation is included in the term privacy so you cannot breach somebody else's privacy ultimately in the navteet singh johar versus union of india 2018 supreme court case the apex court decriminalized consensual sexual intercourse so if consensual se sexual intercourse between adults so if two adults whether they are man man woman woman man woman or any gender sexual orientation anything if they are adults and they are consenting to have sexual intercourse that will not be a crime okay next we will do some offenses against property theft basically it means as we all know theft it is dishonestly taking the possession of something out of uh, the one who is lawfully possessing it so if any person is dishonestly moving any object out of the lawful possession of another person without the consent of such person then that is known as theft okay so if a goes to b's house and without b's consent a moves an object from b's house within b's house only even that is included in theft okay next we come to extortion extortion means that when i am causing any fear of injury i am extorting means i am causing any fear of injury let's say a threatens b that i will kill you if you don't give me this and under that fear b gives an object to a that is extortion okay robbery now what is robbery robbery means either theft or extortion will become robbery in certain cases okay for example while committing theft if there is if death is 
committed okay or if there is attempt to commit death or wrongful restraint or while committing extortion there is fear of death fear of instant death in those cases we will see that theft or extortion are becoming robbery so robbery is not technically uh, an independent offense okay robbery theft or extortion they become robbery in these certain circumstances which are written in 390 then decoity the only difference is that when five or more people are committing robbery okay five or more that is either five or more than five people are committing robbery that is known as decoity okay then there are certain other offenses such as criminal misappropriation breach of trust cheating mischief etc i have just mentioned these they are not as important for your ug clat however i have mentioned the sections so you can yourself look into these sections once but so far as your ug clat is considered uh, they are not that important now offenses relating to marriage firstly if somebody is cohabiting in the belief of marriage let's say a has a is the husband and he has a wife b but a tells c that i have no other wife and a starts living with c a tells c that the, i have no other wife okay and a starts living with c so c has a belief that c is the only wife of a so this is cohabiting in the belief of marriage but in reality a and b's marriage is void because a already has a wife b so in that case a is guilty of this offense cohabiting in belief of marriage bigamy if in the presence of one spouse the person marries another that is bigamy okay marrying again during lifetime of husband or wife then committing any fraud marriage ceremony if somebody dishonestly or fraudulently takes part in a marriage ceremony knowing that it is unlawful then that is a fraud marriage ceremony punishable under section 496 then adultery now adultery means having sexual intercourse outside of marriage or extramarital sexual intercourse previously adultery was punished or previously it was punishable basically if there was a husband okay and he had a wife and the wife had a relation a sexual intercourse with another man let's say p then the husband could fight a case against p or basically prosecute p okay so if you see this provision of adultery it was only a privilege given to husbands not to wife suppose this husband also has sexual intercourse with another with another person let's say c wife had no remedy against c okay the wife could do nothing against c it only was a privilege given to the husbands who could prosecute the paramour of their wife okay so this whole concept was first of all found to be uh, absolutely against the article 14 which is giving us the right to equality it was discriminatory and derogatory to women so the supreme court ultimately also came to the conclusion that if you remember the famous line of the supreme court to love can never be a, a crime so the supreme court has decriminalized adultery however adultery is now not a crime but still it is a ground for divorce so if a person is having any type of sexual intercourse or any type of extramarital relation then the spouse can definitely ask for divorce on that ground though it is not a crime anymore after the joseph shines case of 2018 next we have cruelty by husband or relative of husband which is primarily we are looking into section 498a of ipc now this section section 498a which was also added by the 1983 amendment now this section says that if a husband or relative of husband subjects a woman to cruelty okay subjects a woman to cruelty and this drives the woman basically 
you know the cruelty is such that the woman feels like committing suicide or causes any uh, type of mental or physical injury to herself in such cases we will say that the person is guilty under section 498a okay basically this aims at dowry demands and domestic violence now for the specific offense of dowry demands which was a, which is a burning problem in indian society the the parliament enacted the dowry prohibition act in 1961 okay and this has defined dowry as money or any valuable security given during marriage either by one party to the other party or given by the parents or by any third person so it basically includes any type of gifts which is given in marriage however it does not include the specific presents which are given to the bride or the groom now to stop this type of practice of dowry the parliament had enacted this dowry prohibition act and it prescribes for various types of punishment for giving or taking of dowry or demanding dowry or advertising okay so this is a very stringent act the dowry prohibition act if we see and section 113a of the indian evidence act if we see it also says that if the death of the wife is committed within 7 years of marriage the provision which we discussed earlier that if the death of the wife is committed within 7 years of marriage and it is shown that she was subjected to cruelty by her husband or relative then it will be presumed that it was a dowry death it will be presumed that such death was a dowry death okay as if you can remember section 304b was punishing for dowry death the next set of sections is the the final one firstly we will be looking to defamation so if anybody through signs or visual representations makes any imputation which harms the reputation of another person so the act of a person which harms the reputation of another person is known as defamation okay let's say i publish some very insulting false malicious statements about another person then i am guilty of defamation but there are certain exceptions to it for example if i am speaking the truth then that is not defamation if it is regarding public conduct of some public servants then that is not defamation because it's in public or let's say publishing the proceedings of court or reports of the proceedings of court or if it is some comments on any public performance in such cases we'll see that it is not defamation there are total 10 exceptions to defamation okay finally we have criminal intimidation which means threatening somebody to injure the person or injure another person or to cause alarm to that person basically any type of threat somebody gives threat to another person then that is covered under criminal intimidation or threat and the last section of ipc which deals with the attempt to commit an offense now here if somebody attempts to commit any offense then the punishment will be generally we say if the offense was punishable with life imprisonment then the punishment will be half of life imprisonment or if the punishment was of any other sentence let's say 10 years then it will be half of that sentence okay generally in case of attempt if somebody has made an unsuccessful attempt then the punishment will be half if it was life imprisonment then half of life imprisonment if it was any other sentence then half of that sentence which is provided in the section 511 so with that we come to the conclusion of this video if you have any doubts you could reach out to me i'll put my details in the comments and i hope you like this video please do uh follow us on our social media platforms and if you have any further queries do consider reaching us to reaching out to us in the whatsapp number given this is shirsha ghosh signing off thank you